Hello, hello, everyone. Hello, Wyoming and some Montana friends. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, and thank you to the Wyoming State Survey Agency and CMS Region 8 for this grant that funds um, several aspects of a culture change coalition movement in Wyoming. Uh, the grant is called Implementing Culture Change Throughout Wyoming, Affecting Resident Directed Living and Team Member mm -hmm. Retention. And we came up with that even before a pandemic, everyone. <laughs> Isn't that cool? Uh, good news, good news, everyone. All culture change practices tend to lead towards staff retention. And I know staffing is an issue. So please um, con you know, consider that when we're talking today. And we all know that every nursing home that you represent is in a different position <laughs> and the position today could change tomorrow, right? Oh my goodness. My heart goes out to you with that kind of change and up upset and congratulations, we're all making it. And um, also with that, I would just challenge you, even in a time of crisis, a time of a lot of upheaval, uh, what I've noticed about the culture change practices is that they actually can help. So a lot of people tend to think that we don't have time for culture change. I totally understand that. I don't want to distance that by any means, but I also would love to challenge you to, to, to challenge yourselves that sometimes changing institutional culture is the very thing needed in a crisis. Sometimes crises force our hand to change our practice. I would like to challenge you all to maybe notice places where you could take advantage of what's going on um, and move in the direction of changing institutional culture like you wanted to. And I'll point out a few places where I think that's very doable right now. Um, and rather than, you know, hear a bunch of ideas and just go, nope, can't do that. Nope, can't do that. I would also just challenge you to let this hour be an hour that you let your brain think about how you might do some of these things. You don't have to do them all. My job today is really to show you a lot of practices that could be done. You can take them or leave them. And I've, I've tried to incorporate very simple ones as well because it might feel good to just pick one simple one if that's all you can do. And I, that's okay, I commend you. So we're gonna look at culture change and choices in dining. We're also gonna look at a lot of regulations because they're actually in our favor. So many times people think the regs tell us how we can't do things. I love showing how they show that we can do things. So hopefully you were able to join us last month. We looked at honoring sleep and how it leads to better outcomes. And you know, just tapping into that, um, why are residents woken up? <laughs> and I should have done a poll here. I'm looking for one word. There's one, a one word answer I'm looking for. You guys, you could either unmute yourselves or put it in the chat box. What is the one reason why we wake people up who live in nursing homes? <laughs> Can you tell me? One word. I just okay. added breakfast. Yes, that's it. Yes. <laughs> I knew it. I'm Keith, we are like a brother and sister in this movement. Keith at Granite said breakfast. And maybe someone else did too. And that's right, you guys, that's exactly right. So now I'd love to, you know, if we were in person, it'd be so much more fun to do all this together. But how many of you don't even eat breakfast? And I've been that person most of my adult life. And what would happen to us if we lived in an institution, everyone? What would happen to those of us that don't eat breakfast? The answer is we would eat breakfast. Isn't that kind of sad? And typically that's how it's gone in an institution. In fact, we have taught people who live in nursing homes learned helplessness and here how, here's how it goes. Actually, we've taught um, CNAs learned helplessness first everyone and here's how that goes. A CNA is faced with a person, a real person living their life, sleeping happily and the CNA has to wake them up. Maybe the CNA doesn't wanna wake them up Maybe the CNA doesn't want to wake a person sleeping. I know I don't, but who are they going to listen to? Now, it's not the nurse's fault. It's like, they're going to listen to the nursing home, <laughs> the nursing system, the system, the institutional schedule where, you know, if a CNA did say, hey, this resident doesn't want to wake up, you know, no offense, but it's just the institutional model. Typically, the nurse has had to say, 
she has to get up for breakfast, right? DNA goes in, learned helplessness. They learn not to honor what the resident really wants. They learn to honor what the nurse says, who is driven by the institution. Isn't that sad, everyone? And you do not have to do it that way. Homes for 20, 30 years have stopped doing it that way. And then here's the other learned helplessness. The person learns that if I let them wake me up and if I just go to the dining room and if I just eat a bite of toast and a sip of coffee, then they will let me go back where? <laughs> so sadly, they would let me go back to bed. Now, do you realize that the institutional model is inefficient? It is, it wastes time and it wastes money. You would think in a time when, my, when staffing and money are tight, that we would actually move towards a more individualized practice. Everyone, please hear this. When you follow the lead of the people who live there, it is more efficient. So go back to last month's webinar on honoring sleep. It dovetails, and I say in that webinar, today we'll talk about the open dining practice, which becomes the answer to being able to honor a person's natural sleep. We don't want to wake people up anymore. We want to honor sleep. Sleep is healthy. We call ourselves healthcare for heaven's sake. Sleep is one of the most healthy things we can give any person, and yet we deprive them of it. And we go all through that in last month's webinar. They're all recorded. In fact, they live on the Mountain Pacific website, everyone. You can just go there and watch the recording. You can also let me know if you need anything like the handout, etc. okay? And we have the power to really honor whether someone wants to eat breakfast or not, or eat breakfast later, or never eat breakfast, maybe eat an early lunch. Um, oh, there's the website as well. I myself don't eat breakfast usually, and then I want lunch around 11. Could I get that in your place, the nursing home you represent? And I do believe open dining, the practice of an open dining time, that this is the main practice that we could maybe take advantage of right now, coming out of or during the pandemic. Because if we open up dining rooms and have to keep people distance, notice everyone, not socially distance, for heaven's sake, <laughs> let's hold on to the social, even in the language. It's really physical distancing, right? And so if we have to physically distance people, and not everyone can be in the dining room like they once were, it's the perfect time to create open dining. Isn't that great? You're going to have to anyway. Oh, I love it when there's a win-win. Plus, it's what everybody wants, for heaven's sake. It's probably what you've wanted to do. Um, it's what residents want to live there, probably, and what residents who might move there someday will want. It's what I want. Could it be what it's what you want? And guess what else? When you create choice for the people who live there, did you know you are now more compliant with the many regulations that require choice. For heaven's sake, we need to talk more about that. We worry so much about some things. Well, what about this? What about giving choice like we're supposed to? I'm gonna show you the regs here in a moment. Um, it also builds in time, everyone, for good care. And what we mean by that is no longer is there the rush hour where every CNA has to get every resident to the dining room at the very same time because breakfast is at seven. Do you realize how silly that is? I don't know how we've even gotten away with it. How has it been okay to make people get up and make them go to the dining room at a certain time, whether they're hungry or not, and then make them sit there and what's the experience on the side of the resident to hurry up and wait, and sometimes to fall asleep at the table, right? Do you realize that when a person's asleep or half asleep, and then we try to help them eat, that's actually very unsafe. We, we toss around, oh, you can't do that. It's not safe all the time. That might as well drive us as well to move towards open dining and honoring sleep. And when you've been well rested, you're much more awake, right? Oh, there's all the reasons to do it, everyone. Then CNAs have the chance, the time to actually give great care. They want to brush the hair and brush the teeth and put the earrings in. But if everyone has to be there at the same time, they can't. It's a broken system, everyone. And so um, one way to think of it, I don't think I have this on the slide, is called redesign work. You will end up helping all people who live there eventually get dressed 
and up to eat if they want to. You notice instead of on the institutional schedule, on their schedule, it'll still happen for everyone. And when there's not the rush hour to have everyone done at the same time, then CNAs can be much more supported to do their work and be so proud of it. Plus, it may also be easier than you think, everyone. You may actually already have open dining, but you didn't know it. <laughs> so get this. You know, I'm just going to use the typical dining room. It doesn't even matter how many people live in your home. Just bear with me here, okay? A typical large dining room. How long does it take for your team members to serve everyone? Let's just use an hour as an example. Do you realize that you could stop saying breakfast is at seven and you could start saying breakfast is served from seven to eight? Hey, everybody, you don't have to be there at seven. If you get there at eight, you'll still get breakfast and you can come anywhere in between. The other beautiful part is you have people that wake up early on their own. I love that. And so we start helping those who wake up naturally early, the early birds. We start with them while we honor others who are still sleeping. And yes, maybe till much later in the morning, it's okay. So you might already have it. And I just kind of challenge you, I dare you to start saying breakfast is from this time to this time. And right there, you will begin open dining. Isn't that beautiful? Here's a true story. I was at this home in Missouri where you see this open dining sign. Oh, I should back up, look at this. Meal time, eat anytime you prefer to. Breakfast, six to nine, lunch, 11 to one, dinner, 4.30 to 6.30. You can have your choice off the buffet or order from the menu. <laughs> Isn't that great? And notice it's not a very fancy sign, but it sure has a great message. And so you come in and you have a hot food buffet. You help yourself if you can. Notice the utensils sticking out. Help yourself if you can. That is so beautiful. We take independence away so quickly. Even in independent living, people don't help themselves. And then if you can't, then you have a server. You tell someone what you would like. There's also a fresh salad bar. If you, you know, if there's nothing you could do but start a fresh salad bar, guys, do it or you know, salad to order, do it. We all know we need more fresh vegetables you know, and fresh fruits. And guess what? Um, of course, I don't have her picture here, but I gotta tell you a neat story. This was back in 2001 in a home in Missouri. We were, in the, we were touring the whole home and uh, a woman came out of her door and said to the administrator, I'm awake now and ready for breakfast. I look at my watch, it was 11.45. My institutional brain said, I bet she's confused and she means lunch. That's all that happened. We did a little more walking around. We got to this dining room and I overheard the administrator say to these servers, hey guys, Wyla just woke up and she's ready for breakfast. <laughs> it was the first time I'd seen such a thing. And later the DON told us how life was so much better for Wyla. I don't like to say she no longer had behaviors because you know what, it's not fair to call them behaviors. How many people who live in the nursing home have a different schedule than the nursing home schedule? Whose behaviors are they really? We should call them on us. There are behaviors, <laughs> right? They're institutional behaviors that don't match people. And so the people shouldn't be the one in the wrong, right? Oh, I like that. I don't think I've ever said it that way before. They also did a plate waste study. If you've never done this, everyone, I highly recommend it. And they realized that, that by moving over to buffet and menu, they saved $20,000 annually. What would you do with 20,000 bucks a, a year more? And if you ever do a study like that and you realize money that could be saved, don't lose it. Say that's our 20,000. We want to do this or that <laughs> with that money. You know, Don't let it just sort of disappear. And they made a focus to stop just serving supplements so quickly. Do you realize most nursing homes are known, I hate to say it, for bingo and supplements. <laughs> and I think they could be known for life, living true, wonderful, big life. You know, if we give a bigger life to people, they probably wouldn't have time for bingo. And I'm going to tell you more about a part of the movement called Real Foods First in a minute. And that's how you can stop using the very expensive supplements. So jumping into a regulation that comes to mind to many people right here at this point on open dining, 
is what some people call the 14 hour rule. To be honest, I wish we had learned and called it the 16 hour rule. And here's why. So this rig is not new. It's been in the rig since uh, 87 and, it, and it's still there. There must be no more than 14 hours between a substantial evening meal and breakfast the following day. It seems like that's where everybody stopped reading, except when a nourishing snack is served at bedtime, up to 16 hours may elapse between a substantial evening meal and breakfast the following day if a resident group agrees, resident group agrees everyone, pretty likely to this meal span. So you can have 16 hours if you needed it and you got agreement with the people who live there. And I'm guessing all of your homes already provide substantial, well, a substantial evening meal, of course, but uh, what meant <laughs> a nourishing snack um, at bedtime. So now you could go to resident council, go get it all cleared, that's fine. But I'll tell you another honest truth. No matter what times of an open supper and then an open breakfast, if you come to the end of supper and the beginning of breakfast, you will always have a 14 hour um, gap. It's no problem. And remember, you are honoring choice to residents more than ever before. There's a lot more regs about choice than there are about um, our meal span times. Now this tag goes on to say the following, each resident must receive and your home must provide at least three meals a day at regular times comparable to normal meal times in the community or in accordance with resident needs, preferences, requests, and plan of care. See, they're trying to get at this that it does not have to be set times, period, okay? Look at that, or with resident needs, what are your needs for your timing of meals? Uh, preferences, what are your preferences for timing of meals? Requests and what's on your care plan? Wow. Next point, suitable, nourishing, alternative meals and snacks must be provided to residents who want to eat at non-traditional times or outside of scheduled meal service times consistent with the resident plan of care. So do you see CMS moving in this direction, starting to mention that you are supposed to offer suitable, nourishing, alternative meals and snacks who peep for those who want to eat at non-traditional times. You might as well do open dining times, you see, because that would very likely meet that need. Isn't that something? So open dining equals choices and preferences honored. Guess what? The word preferences, if you do a word search, shows up 207 times in the CMS regs. <laughs> That's a lot. It wasn't that much in the old set of regs. So start talking about that. Preferences 207 times. In fact, I don't think I include it here, but, but guess what? The concept of preferences rises to the level of immediate jeopardy under um, nutrition services. You can check me. I don't think I included that. I wish I had. All right, now tag 800, food and nutrition services. This requirement expect, expects there is ongoing communication and coordination among and between staff within all departments to ensure resident assessment, care plan, actual food and nutrition services meet each resident's daily nutritional and dietary needs and choices. So ongoing communication and coordination. I love that, everybody. Think about it. If you're really going to honor someone's preferences, you all got to be on the same page. You know, CNAs need to be sharing when someone usually gets up or typically gets up or today if they woke up or not, you know if they had a bad night of sleep and they're still sleeping and maybe they want lunch at 11, like me, okay? It's so good. Then while it may be challenging to meet every resident's individual preferences, incorporating a resident's preferences and dietary needs will ensure residents are offered meaningful choices in meals and diets that are nutritionally adequate and satisfying to the individual. Woo. So incorporating preferences, of course. Do you realize everyone, Gone are the days that we should be care planning problems. In fact, I've been saying it for years, we should be care planning preferences more than problems. See the, the institutional um, care plan that guided us to identify problems was a problem in and of itself because it, it made everything about the person look like it was a problem. 
And thankfully, most of you use point click here and they have changed the word to focus, which I commend. Wherever they got that message, thank you, God, because it's not a problem necessarily, okay? And to be honest, <laughs> for probably every focus in a person's life, there should be preferences identified around that focus. And see, that's how care planning should go. And life just goes better for everybody, right? When you know the preferences. And then reasonable efforts to accommodate these choices and preferences must be addressed by you all. I do avoid that F word. I don't say it. <laughs> Why? Because real people live in homes and also communities. People don't live in facilities. A facility is a school and people don't live in a school. That's why it's a facility. Back to that good communication. Are you using huddles? There's the shift huddle. There's the morning huddle. Sometimes leadership comes to neighborhood huddles. There can be huddles after an incident or a fall. And then there can be huddles around, um, you know, trending things like infections. You can have a huddle for anything. And I raise it here because of that red tag saying, you got to have ongoing communication and coordination between staff of all departments. Those huddles are a way to do that. Another beautiful way to meet preferences and choices and different timing of things, everyone, is a hot cart system that's becoming much more popular. So notice the cart there. Only one, one or two people who are trained are in and out of the cart. So it's not like a buffet, okay? So no one's putting their hands in there. And it, it gives team members the opportunity to really honor choice. And residents can see the food, smell the food, make their choice on the spot. You do not need to be ordering things ahead of time. Ordering what you want to eat today for tomorrow. I don't know that that makes a lot of sense. Um, what if you change your mind? What if you don't feel as good? Who knows what, right? So it really is self-directed dining. Everything is mobile, food and drink, lots of choice, lots of flexibility. Your food is hotter. It ends up saving money. Uh, these carts were designed by Suzanne Queering, and they are sold by everybody. Uh, Gordon Foods, Lakeside. And um, guess what? Suzanne is going to be a guest speaker at our March uh, Culture Change event. So hang on to that. And here's the best part. One time a person said, you know what? Just mashed potatoes with lots of gravy, please. And see, because of a, a what's the word? The food is right here. You can do whatever you need to right now. You can really honor choice like that. <laughs> Just mashed potatoes and gravy, please. Isn't that beautiful? Beautiful. Back to the regs. Menus must reflect based on, the, on your reasonable efforts. CMS says that a lot, reasonable efforts, the religious, cultural, and ethnic needs of the resident population, as well as, yay, input received from residents and resident groups. So take a moment, take a breath. I'll take a breath and a drink <laughs> and think about that. Have you ever really talked to your, the people who live there about religious and cultural and ethnic needs and the menu? Uh, also, look at this. Nothing in this paragraph should be construed to limit the resident's right to make personal dietary choices. I do believe this stems from when menus might, you know, sometimes surveyors would look at the menu and make sure every single thing was given to the resident. And I just, I happen to know of a story like milk was not given to the resident. And so therefore the menu wasn't followed and there was no comment from the resident. And to, to me, everybody, I feel like it could be me. I used to love milk, yes, but now I can't drink it. And so even though it's on the menu, I'm not gonna drink it, you see? So nothing should be construed to limit residents' right to make personal dietary choices. That is very good. And that's an addition in the new regs. Do any of you know how new the new regs are? There's a trivia question. I'll look in the chat box by the end and Julia Van Dyke, you can't answer. <laughs> okay. Each resident receives and facility provides. Okay, most of this has been around. Um, foods prepared by methods that can serve nutritive value, flavor, and appearance. Food and drink that's palatable, attractive, safe, appetizing temperature. Food prepared in a form designed to meet individual needs. This is new. Food that accommodates resident allergies and tolerances and preferences. So good. 
and appealing options of similar nutritive value to residents who choose not to eat food that is initially served or who request a different meal choice. Do you realize what a waste of time and money that is if you serve food that someone says no thanks? Again, the idea of open dining, moving into menu and um, maybe buffet really helps to get it right the first time and not waste so much food. And even under drinks comes the word preferences again. Then we have food safety. I just wanna point out that CMS does speak to the idea that um, you, know, you can get foods from local producers as long as they're subject to local and state laws. Also, this provision does not prohibit or prevent homes from using produce grown in your building or in your garden, I should say. Subject to compliance with applicable safe growing and food handling practices. So I did a lot of research on this actually, and I have a resource coming up for you, but you can use food from the garden as long as you know you have good practice, like no dogs are defecating in the garden. That's you know basically it. And then this provision does not preclude residents from consuming foods not procured by the facility. So the residents can bring in food from the outside and you have to have a policy regarding use and storage of those foods brought to residents by family and other visit visitors to ensure safe and sanitary storage, handling, and consumption. So it's good. Residents should be able to accept the homemade pickles. And then it's just good to think it through. Where are the pickles going to stay? You know, who's going to peek in on the little um, refrigerator in someone's room? All these things are very doable. I need you to hear that. So many homes go to kind of the institutional thinking like, oh, nobody can have that. When in fact, there's many nursing homes who've had these things for many years. Here's some more regarding resident choice. First of all, CMS has a beautiful definition of person-centered care, which is um, to focus on the resident as the locus of control. Mm, so good. And support the resident in making their own choices and having control over their daily lives. That is huge. Maybe make a copy and post it all around. The resident is the locus of control, not the institution. Then under resident rights, we have some beautiful regs. The, we've always had a reg that, that speaks to respect and dignity, quality of life. Notice the last part after quality of life, recognizing each resident's individuality. So good. Individuals get lost in an institution. And then your home must protect and promote the rights of the resident. Now I've been around regs a long time. I surveyed, I worked for CMS central office. And I, I just have to confess, but I, I feel like CMS it's saying something in between the lines, okay? If they say you, we must protect and promote the rights of residents, that's never been said before, everybody. It sort of feels like what's not being said is, hey, you're pretty good at giving residents a list. You're pretty good at posting it in the hall and you're pretty good at reviewing one resident right for resident council meetings, see? But how good are you at really going out of your way to protect resident rights and even promote them? that is so strong and so good. And you could let that guide whatever you do next. You know, the right to make choice, the right to sleep, <laughs> you know, to maybe move into these, uh, this arena of more choice in dining and dining times. And then residents' wishes and preferences must be considered in the exercise of rights by the representative. Now that means family or whoever the representative is. And what this is saying, everyone, this has never been there before. Why would CMS add that residents' wishes and preferences must be considered in the exercise of rights by the representative? You see, it's not, hey, daughter, what do you want? It's, hey, daughter, what does your mom want? Hey, daughter, what would your mom say she wants if she could? Hey, daughter, how has your mom lived all these years with her diabetes or whatever? We kind of have to reframe the question. No offense to family members, we have some on the line. And I'd love to know what you think of this, Paula. <laughs> but I think of it as reframing the question and just not saying, daughter, what do you want? The, the question needs to be reframed. Excuse me, reframed. Daughter, what would your mom want? And we all need to do that, all of us. 
dietitian, not what you want. What would, what does this person want and how can we make it work? You know, whatever our discipline is, all of us have to honor what the resident, the person wants and how can we make it work and how can we mitigate risk? Then we have, this is a new reg everyone and it really speaks of the culture change movement. And I'd love for you to listen for some choice words, words that regard choices. <laughs> Ready? Resident has the right to be informed of risks and benefits of proposed care, of treatment and treatment alternatives or treatment options, and to choose the alternative or option he or she prefers. <laughs> Isn't that great? Do you realize everyone, there are risks and benefits to every single thing. How dare we make it sound like you must have a pureed diet. A pureed diet can kill someone, everyone. The food doesn't taste so good. People don't eat it. They lose weight. And guess what? We lose track of why they lost weight. You know, weight loss takes three months and six months to show up. Do you think we remember? It's because, you know, of the pureed hamburger that doesn't taste so good. Um, or I'll, I'll tell you another example coming up that could easily happen to me. And so always realizing every single thing has risks and benefits, risks and benefits. Have we thought of them all? Have we said them all? Have we shared them all? And does this person know, you know what they are? Um, so it's really something to be mindful of. And then this regulation under resident rights um, has changed a little. It says the right to request, refuse, and or discontinue treatment. It used to say the resident has the right to refuse treatment. And man, was that strong. Right. And in a, in a little way, I miss it. However, this is even stronger because not only do they have the right to refuse, they have the right to. Re the section of rights, self-determination, residents have the right to choose activities, schedules, health care and providers of health care. And um, they also have the right to include sleeping and waking times. Now, to be honest, the most challenging part there is schedules, the right to choose schedules. You know, do your, do the people who live where you work really have the right to choose their own schedule? Usually it's the institutional schedule and that's it. And that's what we're talking about. And here it is, another reg that's been around a long time since 1987. And then um, also, this is super strong. We've quoted it for decades. It's been there since 87 as well, National Nursing Home Reform Act. The right to make choices about aspects of his or her life that are significant to them. Sleep is significant to me, how about you? Eating when I wanna eat is significant to me, how about you? So notice, once again, I just have to keep saying it. We let regs hold us back when in fact regs should be pushing us toward doing these more um, individualized honoring practices. Now, CMS refers to the dining practice standards um, and they give the link and they mention the toolkit. I'm very fortunate, I've been very involved with all of this. I was the facilitator of the um, National Symposium in 2010 with CMS and the Pioneer Network on Food and Dining, which led to a task force, which I got to facilitate, where we wrote these dining practice standards and got agreement by 12 clinical national groups like physicians and nurses and dietitians and speech therapists. Uh, they agreed on them. And then I also got to lead the task force that developed a toolkit. So we started to get questions from nursing homes who has implemented these new standards and could we start to see policies and forms, et cetera? And so we did that. CMS even did a video. I'm not sure if it's still at that link. I should have checked, but we got to do a video in the studio at CMS supporting these new standards of practice. So we could actually use your help uh, for people to start to learn them more. They're free, the standards. There is a minimal charge for the toolkit, but you would be supporting the Pioneer Network, which is the National Culture Change Organization. And the new dining practice standards look like this. Um, they're so good, so good, promise you. Here's, I don't have time, but I snuck a couple things in here. So for instance, uh, one of the new um, standards of practice is 
is starting to consider that a red flag for all of us surveyors and providers would be if you just see a tray line in the kitchen, okay? Like it might imply no choice, you see? Now maybe people chose those things. That's why it's a red flag to go double check. And also if there's a sign in the dining room that says breakfast is at seven, see that's a red flag for what? What's not being honored? Choice, it's a contradiction of choice, wow. Another red flag is the label non-compliant. See if a person is called non-compliant or if it's all over their care plan and she's non-compliant, it actually means what? That there's a choice that they wanna make not to follow that physician diet order perhaps, but we're not gonna let them. So if we don't let someone make a choice, who's non-compliant now? And I just showed you all those strong regs. The nursing home is actually non-compliant. We must learn how to work with people, support their choice and mitigate risk at the same time. Let me quickly give you an easy example. If someone says, no, I will not eat three, we quickly move over to offering the next best thing. What would it be? You all know, and it's not grounded and it's not mechanical. Think of the words, what the heck is grounded and what the heck is mechanical? What we really mean is real food, like a real breast of chicken, finely chopped. And what I've learned everyone is a breast of chicken baked in the oven retains its moisture better than um, you know, grinding it in the grinder. And then when we just finally chop it, it tends to go down just as easily. Another big win for all of us is to grow, the way I think of it is to grow the list of foods that are naturally pureed. Think about guacamole, refried beans, hummus. There's a lot of great foods that are naturally pureed. And to offer more and more of those will be much more accepted, won't they, by you and me? Um, than grinding the hamburger, you see? To grind things that aren't normally ground is the problem. And then this toolkit, let me just show you a little bit about it. We did model policies and procedures uh, regarding each of the sections of the standards. So diet liberalization, altered consistency, real foods, honoring choice, and preventing negative outcomes. And we did a model policy and procedure on how to maintain gardens, which we just read about. We also, ooh, my favorite thing, we put together an informed choice form, by the way. Those two words I would highly recommend using. Train your mouth, train your brain, all of you, to talk about the informed choice. It's language that does come from CMS. And notice it's such a win-win. We do the informing, the person makes the choice. It's like, boom, boom. Remind them, oh, that bacon might, might. <laughs> and he says, I don't care. <laughs> I don't care if I die from eating the bacon. Okay. And then, by the way, we also need to get better at documenting those discussions. When you remind someone, teach someone, educate. And of course, I'm picking an easy one, right? When a person can tell you, I don't care if I die from eating the bacon. But we need to get very good at documenting the dialogue of discussion, it's called. And so if a person says it on the bus, get your bus driver to write it down and know to do that. If a person says it in the shower, get that person to write it down. And see, you are doing your very best at honoring what a person wants and doesn't want and how many times you've heard it, okay? Then we've also learned in this process, again, you talk about it as a team in the care conference with all the right people, all the right people. So the residents there, the family member representative is there, the right professionals are all there. And together you support the person. Remember this guy, we have to support the person, it's their life. What is their choice? Great, this is their choice, no puree. How can we all support that? And we all agree what we're gonna do different. And, and chances are much less that, you know, there's litigation later if something goes wrong. If the family member was there and they heard mom and it's documented and how your team wants to support mom, see? And all the duck in the bus, <laughs> in the bath, right? And uh, also, you know, the same for um, preventing issues with complaints and problems that way. Uh, we have a, a tool that um, guides people in walking around at meal times. We have a resident council interview tool. We have a resident satisfaction tool. And another favorite of mine are tip sheets for professionals. 
tip sheets and moving in this direction to honor choice and offer more choice and liberalizing restricted diets. And then we also put together three resident and family brochures, um, the right to choice, the right to eat no food, the right to an unrestricted diet. So um, there's more than that. There's, a, there's learning circle questions. There's a personal nutrition biography form that is super duper cool. Think about this guys, you and I each have a personal nutrition biography. I never thought of that till I learned this. And so you have food you love and food you hate and foods that hurt you and foods that don't go down right and foods that give you bad breath, <laughs> you know, foods that hurt your tummy, whatever it is, right? We all just have weird things with food that either work well or not well. That's your biography, comfort foods, right? Isn't that cool if you were to learn that about the people that you serve? All right, I have a little dining clip to show you. Um, let me prep you. My favorite food is uh, Dining with Friends is a 20 minute video that was created, you know, with wonderful culture change ideas. And I can't show you the whole thing because you have to pay to get it. But this is the trailer, just a three minute trailer. Here we go. It's potato chips. I could eat them all day. I think of the chili my grandmother would make. I think of how on Christmas Eve, we always make sure we cook that chili recipe. My grandmother came from Hungary, and there were a lot of Hungarian foods and things that she made that, um, you know, we had growing up as a kid. Food does a lot of different things for a lot of people. Some people it's comfort, some people it's relaxation, and some people it's socialization. The philosophy at the Alzheimer's Resource Center embraces the idea that living is important and it's important to recognize that each individual who has Alzheimer's disease is going to be different and it's important to connect with each of those people. These are people who have families, who have loved ones, who have lived wonderful lives. They are teachers, they are doctors, they are nurses, they are social workers, they are housewives, mothers. They are not feeds, and so we never use that word. Dining with friends is starting off with recognizing that person and building a connection with them, finding out their life story and uniting yourself with them. Okay. Mary, you have six kids. Yes? Yep. The Dining with Friends program, created at the Alzheimer's Resource Center, is a person-centered approach to dining that offers innovative solutions to overcome the roadblocks that dementia has on nutrition, hydration, and socialization. The program focuses on four important areas that can be remembered through the acronym D-I-N-E. The program emphasizes the social nature of dining, encouraging independence, innovative and nutritious meal preparation ideas, and creating the optimal environment for dining. Let's begin by exploring the concept that dining is social. When you think about meals, it isn't enough to think about, well, what did I eat last night? I think about the people that I ate with, and I think about the experience that I had. Each resident is different and has different needs. You have to know them individually and get close to them in order to know how to dine with them. I know that you like a song, huh? Yeah. Will you sing it with me if I sing it with you? Yeah. You are yeah, my yeah, sunshine, yeah. my only sunshine. You we met me at the A&P. I was 17 and I was a stock boy and she was a cashier and uh, she caught my eye right away. She loved candy and she was a great sweet eater and especially the gummier, the more the licorice, the better. You learn more about the resident and then you meet their family members and you really get to learn a lot about them. So it just makes you bond closer with your residents. All right, so I'm sorry, the trailer doesn't really do it justice, but uh, a couple of things I've learned from this group um, uh, that I really have loved learning is you could challenge your kitchen team to make almost anything into a finger food. It's so fun to see them show you like a pot pie that they turn into a finger food, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, they also remind us people living with dementia do better to just with one item at a time. Try putting um, one item in a small bowl at a time. They tend to do great. There's only one, one, you know, not more than that. 
Uh, they also remind us of all your OTs know this, um, but somehow I feel like we don't talk about it anymore. We should really never feed a person just fork to mouth. We should either put the fork in their hand if they can, and we guide their hand to feed themselves. That's ideal. Or if they can't hold the fork, then we hold the fork, but you put their hand on your arm and it's still um, called a carrying hand where it prompts them to know, you know, their elbow and food is coming. Isn't that cool? And there's just so much more about like cue cards of knowing residents well and things to talk about so much more, just highly recommend it as a, as a resource. And then, like I said, even a simple idea to take away today might be learning your residents, um, the people who live where you work. And I, and I know that we're also using the word neighbor, everyone, as a coalition in your state. The neighbors who live where you work um, may be learning their simple pleasures. A simple pleasure is something that is just a simple preference, a simple favorite, you know, not tea, but maybe your favorite kind of tea, the raspberry zinger tea, whatever the favorite is. And maybe that could be something you could do even in a time like this. Now, another one is a daily pleasure. They're actually two different things. A daily pleasure means that you make it happen every day, no matter what. And like, I'm guessing for many of us, it's coffee, you know? <laughs> like my simple pleasure would be to take a walk, but I may not make that happen in the weather and my time, right? But a coffee, I make happen. <laughs> if I'm traveling, I find the coffee. You see, how about you? What do you make happen? That's a daily pleasure. And what do you hope happens? Sometimes that's a simple pleasure. And you could have fun talking to the people that you serve on what these are for them. Um, and um, then, you know, this is more than a, simple or daily pleasure, I think. And I told you this would come up again, knowing someone's preferences uh, can actually impact their, their nutrition, their weight. Um, apparently I am a saltaholic. I didn't really know that until people told me, oh, you salt your pizza? Yep, I do. And no, Carmen, not, I don't keep salt in my purse just in case. <laughs> and then see, if you see me salting my pizza living in a nursing home, what is pretty likely to happen? No offense, but you know, we're always trying to prevent bad things and perhaps someone thinks salt on pizza equals bad, right? And now what if I don't get to eat my salt and I'm used to it and it doesn't taste good, see? I could lose weight and it, will people remember three months later, six months later, why am I losing weight? Because no one ever let me have my salt again, right? Or sadly, I could go down the route where I get very upset, right? I hurt someone, right? I get a fancy diagnosis, I get drugs now. That is not the goal. All I want is my salt. Or sadly, if I keep it in my purse now, you know darn well I'm gonna be taking it whenever I can, right? And now what am I? Now I'm a thief and a hoarder is what I would get labeled in most institutions, everyone. How about you? You're gonna be a thief and a hoarder too? How dare we, dare we label people like that when all someone might want is their salt? You see, you see how it's more than a pleasure or a preference. It's really part of who I am. And then lastly, forgive me, I'm gonna race through anything dining related from the artifacts of culture change measurement tool. I want you to see that these are deemed culture change dining practices in a national tool that's been around for like almost 20 years. Um, that your home offers a restaurant style or buffet or family style that each meal is available for at least two hours and residents can come and go as they choose. You will also notice regs that we cite that are in support of these things, they're not against. Residents are supported to prepare or serve, serve food per their preferences and ability. And we're not just talking about cooking groups, nope. Snacks and drinks are easily available at all times without having to ask, wow, in a stocked pantry or refrigerator or snack bar. In addition to snacks, residents can order food from the kitchen 24 hours a day. I've heard administrators say it's their house, it's their kitchen, they can have food whenever they want. And then to all team members are, well, beyond the kitchen, team members are empowered to provide food upon resident requests. Sometimes that simply means like nurses at night have the key to the kitchen. It's an institutional practice to everyone when residents have to ask for everything they need. What's normal is you have easy access, like in your house. We, the culture change movement calls it refrigerator rights. 
Um, culture changed homes don't have their kitchens closed at night. The attitude is they live here. This is their home. That's their kitchen. Like I said, so you get them food whenever they want. Baked goods are baked in all resident living areas, like a bread machine or convection oven, at least weekly. You have a policy to consider the regular diet prior to considering restricted diets. Hopefully this is happening in Wyoming. I'm not sure. Someone can tell me. We're Nationally, we're seeing a trend that more people come in on a regular diet than a restricted diet, and that's the goal. Residents are educated in making informed choices about their diet. Before commercial supplements are used, real foods are offered like smoothies and shakes and malts. Um, I just love it. I love malts. Other people love shakes. It maybe like smoothies. And the home adheres to the dining practice standards I told you about. Here's a little clip about real food too. It's like 30 seconds. Watch. Changing design can be as simple as uh, we brought our toasters into our dining room. It doesn't sound like a big deal, but we actually physically set the toasters in the middle of the dining room. When the core team, the little sub team met, they said, you know, as take toast in, we cook it in the, in the kitchen, stack her up, bring it out. By the time it gets out into the dining room, it's cold and hard. And um, that's just the way it's always been. So now if the resident says, I would like a piece of toast, um, we go over and put it in the toaster and we butter it and we give it to them right there. Now, it was just an experiment. The whole building was talking about it for days afterwards, over toast. And I think it was probably the very best thing that we ever did to start with that because um, everybody got excited about all the other things they thought that we could do too. And so the residents were having their picture taken and holding their toast up, so, which was interesting. Just a fun example. Maybe if you do nothing else, you just make toast as people want it and it's crunchy and yummy. Changing design. Cool. Home celebrates resident individual birthdays rather than or in addition to celebrating birthdays in a group each month. Each resident's wishes to how to celebrate are discovered and honored. Uh, some of our teams on the line this year in the project are doing this and having just so much fun. Uh, how about essential oils to enhance appetite? And residents determine daily schedules and can make spontaneous requests and changes. Resident schedule preferences are integrated into the team member schedules. So a famous quote from our movement, no longer are the needs of the institution to come before the needs of the individual. Residents participate in a committee that makes decisions about decor. That could be dining drink items. Oh, I've seen teams do it. Residents participate in committees about food and menu planning and dining ambiance. We've had teams do that this year. Home supports the right of residents to have a refrigerator in the room. Notice the wording. We support this right. We figure it out. We make it work. So many homes go, we can't do that. <laughs> Who would check on it? No, no, no. You know, no, flip it. How could we make it work? Residents and families have easy access to microwaves, assistance if needed, as well as coffee makers. We, tr we wanted to get the idea of what if you want a coffee pot in your room? I think that's really good to think about. I'm going to want one. If I move in your nursing home tomorrow, I would want one. And rather than just say no, how can we move towards maybe? <laughs> and even yes, if I can do it. And if not, I at least have easy access to it. In dining rooms, meals are not eaten on trays. Food is removed from any tray used for transport. Food is served on normal plateware, china, glassware, silverware. Disposable are just on special occasions or picnics. Each dining room table has condiments such as salt and pepper. And last but not least, that bibs or clothing protectors, no matter what you call them, um, are not used. Linen and paper napkins are used instead. Uh, oh, this is the last one. I think the home has a cafe or restaurant uh, available where residents can obtain food and drinks daily, residents and families. Wow, I've seen it. Um, <laughs> I shouldn't say last one, I can't remember, sorry. A uh, store or shop where residents and visitors can obtain gifts, toiletry, snacks. Here's another one, Sandal Wood did a Sandal Mart with a grand opening, cutting the ribbon. <laughs> uh, one home just found a spot that used to be an office storage room that wasn't being used. Um, I've even seen homes simply use an armoire and all the goodies are kept locked in the armoire and residents leave the gift shop where snacks, et cetera, can be purchased. And then a kitchen or rehab apartment or activity kitchen is available for residents and families to cook and bake. And 
you intentionally notify residents and families of this availability. One of my favorites. Most of you have at least a rehab apartment. Let residents and families know if they want to help mom bake her cinnamon rolls, you please go do it. And then all you need to do to make it work for everyone is have a sign-up sheet. So even the OTs and the PTs have to sign up as well as a family or resident. It could be so easy. I want to thank Star Valley, South Lincoln, and Granite Rehab. They started in the first year of this project and they're still in it. Life Care Casper is joining midway through. We did lose two and we're looking for another home to join mid midway. We'd love to have you. It's free coaching on culture change once a month and uh, coaching to implement at least three practices. And then we will also need five new homes um, starting in April, but we're gonna honor those that joined mid-year to stay in. So we may need just three or four homes, but we do need more homes in April. If you're interested, let me know. We also wanna let you all know that in March, we're having an entire month of culture change. So it was gonna be an in-person one day conference, but with you know the pandemic, we quickly changed that. But here it comes everyone. And I'm sorry, this is not ideal, but I have a flyer, we'll be getting it out to everyone. Every Tuesday in March is a guest speaker. We have shared leadership and learning circles. Um, more on person-directed dining. Uh, like I said, Suzanne Queering, the developer of the Suzy Q cart, valuing team members, community meetings, and restorative sleep. And then we're also offering 10 special sessions. We're calling them uh, a session for each of the disciplines. But we're going to start with a special session for residents and then one for families. And we're going to need your help to get residents on a Zoom. <laughs> That's going to be great and family members. And then another big deal that month on the 25th, it'll be the last webinar like this. Usually this is the last Friday of the month. And you will then hear from the homes that have been in this project. So Granite and South Lincoln and Star Valley, if you're listening, we we'll have to line up, you know, for you to share your journey and get some slides and photos ready. Um, we have two big goals uh, that every person working in a nursing home learns about culture change. So please spread what you learned today. And the link for this recording will be available within the hour. And our other goal is what if every person who lives in a nursing home in Wyoming is not woken up and their natural sleep is honored. We are working to change language please join us. There's some examples. Our next webinar, uh, a topic that has been requested, and I'm just calling it creating connectedness. What if all of us became a connectedness coordinator? And with that, I can take questions and we are almost done. Who's got a question or a comment or an idea? Please, anybody, somebody, and then we'll go. <laughs> And you can unmute yourselves if you want. Any question or idea? There we go. Come on, Wyoming. Who could say share something? Please. <laughs> Hello, can you hear me? Yes, hi, Keith. Hi. Keith. It's Keith and Cheyenne. Okay. I love the ideas for dining. And I I'm really, really interested in at some point in time trying to get implemented as much as we can. The worst part is right now is that our hands are so tied with all the restrictions with COVID. And the fact that it's gotten to where I am so short staffed, I can't hardly even keep up with what we're doing now. And I can't get people to even apply for a position. <laughs> And it's, it's really frustrating. I mean, I absolutely love the ideas. And there's some of them, honestly, in where this is a three floor facility with one kitchen. It's a very old building. We don't have even the electrical outlets in, on these floors to, to implement some of this stuff. But there's a lot we could do that there is. There's a ton we could do. But at the moment, I don't, I, there's, I mean, I, we haven't even been able to put salt, pepper, shakers and stuff on the tables in months. Well, in over a year and a half now because of the whole COVID thing. 
And it's just, it, oh, it's, it is terribly frustrating because I know how much it hurts the residents. And, you know, I'm just thinking that we really need CMS to lighten up on some of our restrictions because, you know what, it's not going away. We just have to learn to live with it. And then we need to figure out a way to get people to come and work. And then, then we'll worry about budget adjustments and all the other stuff to make it happen. But, you know, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's so many multi-layered what we have to do. And I want to do it, <laughs> Don't, you know, but it is, it is really frustrating. Well, hey, Keith, you said there are some things we can do. Like, I'm just curious, was there, was there one thing that came to the top of something you could do? Well, uh, I want to I want to just get back to the basics of having salt pepper on the tables, having their sugar caddies, you know, sweetener caddies back on the tables. You know, go back to you know, we try and give them a good amount of of alternates. Um, you know, for for the way we have to prepare the food down in the central kitchen and you know, transport it up. We do offer them like fried eggs and toast every morning, you know. There's certain things that we do do. But it would be really nice if I could figure out a way to put, you know, a, a, a regular wall plug-in toaster up on the floors and be able to make it fresh. And, you know, then they could all, we could also offer, you know, toaster waffles and toaster pancakes and Pop-Tarts for them, you know, just some simple little additions. Yes. That, yes. and then, you know, with the, with the lunch, there's, a, you know, our other menus, there's a lot of things that we would love to be able to do. And right now, it comes down to the, the biggest part is, is staffing, honestly. And I think that that's, that's a, where our hands are so tied that you know we want to do all this stuff. And I know we're gonna have to do it incrementally, but you know we need to figure out a way to get people interested in, in coming into this field. Well, see. Keith, I believe that if we move in the direction of some of these ideas, that will draw people. I hope so. Let's, right. Let's, you know, let's think about it. Do you want to live in a, Do you want to work in an institution that does things in an institutional way, or do you want to work in a place that's really working towards becoming true home and putting the individuals first and relationship oriented? You know. You guys, I was an activity director and one time I took a cruise and I really looked at the activity director job on a cruise ship, right? But I realized there's no relationship. You tell people what they can do this week and then they're gone. And I think something we can brag about is come build relationship with beautiful older people, you know? It draws people, it truly does. You wanna work in a restaurant and never really know the people or come, you know, get in some, you know, older people speaking into your life. So I don't know. I, I apologize, everyone, if, if this felt frustrating, but I would, I'm also a person who loves a challenge and I'm guessing maybe you do too. And so please leave this with what, what could this challenge us to do? And maybe it could be a strategy to get new staff members interested in this work. You know, that's all I can say. And then yeah. we just have one question. Um, I don't know if anyone can help me here. Um, it says, is there any weight history trending down? Do any of you have weight trending down? I guess is the question. <laughs> I haven't heard it to be a large problem. Anybody else? I think actually I've seen it both ways in our facility and it's due, I really think it's due to the lockdown and the restrictions we put on them. We had a group of residents that isolate and depression and they went in the weight loss trending because they weren't eating properly they had no stimulate stimulation and then you have another group that sat in their rooms and they took their depression <laughs> the opposite way and they are trending up 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 <laughs> hey thanks Keith probably goes both ways I appreciate that well real life real choices everybody less institutional Personally, I believe it can help in all these arenas. Um, so Keith, thanks for your in, uh, for joining me here at the end, okay? Appreciate it. All right, well, 
everybody. Thank you so much. We will see you next time. Here's to culture change in Wyoming. <laughs> Bye now. <laughs>